Shobhna ma'am to all of you. Welcome to the Schoolscape ma'am. I am Nalini. I am a coordinator and associate director for the elementary course. And uh, let me introduce uh, our uh, Ms. Shobhna Vaidyanathan. She started as a director at IMTC Chennai from 1999. She is a gold medalist in home science from Andhra Pradesh Agriculture University, 1980. She completed her Montessori teacher training in 1981 at Hyderabad under the directorship of Mr. S.R. Swami and received the AMI diploma. During her tenure at IMTC Chennai, Ms. Shobana received her certificate to be an independent director of training from IMC Bangalore in 2008. And she also completed her education leadership program conducted by Kurvela Job Initiative Chennai. And uh, she has 25 years of working experience with children in Montessori environments. And she uh, passionately believes that it's the only method that addresses needs of all developmental needs of child. And she shares her adult students her 25 years of varied experience of working with children at the different schools, Lumbini in Hyderabad, Abacus Monastery School and Maitri in Chennai. And she's also founder principal of Maitri. Uh, so she gained a deep insights into the doubts and difficulties adults face while working with children through her other experiences also at Nama Bhumi and SOS Village School, Tambaram. As a member of IMTC Chennai team, she has been consultant for various Montessori schools to help them set up Montessori environments and provide in-house training for their teachers. She conducts workshops for organizations and schools to spread awareness of the Montessori method and philosophy. She was uh, honorary vice chairman of Indian Montessori Center, Tamil Nadu chapter and has been conveyor of Maitri conferences held at Chennai, an IMC initiative to create awareness regarding the Montessori movement. She has represented, she has presented paper, papers at national conferences, including one on the social question of the child at a national seminar organized by the Department of Elementary Education, NCRT, New Delhi. Single-minded and energetic, Shobana Vaidyanathan is a stickler for work and wholeheartedly gives her time and energy to any task that she undertakes. Most welcome, ma'am. Welcome to the Schoolscape and all of our students. And uh, we wish you share your knowledge, wisdom and experience with all of us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nandi. Uh, all these accords that you read in fact, to begin with, I have to show my gratitude to your director, Mrs. Amukta Mahapat. I had no idea whether I'll become a director to work with the adults or uh, conduct workshops, no idea at all. I was wanting to only work with children, be in a monastery environment, be, and remain a happy teacher. But those of all already have experienced yes. yes. She is the one who is very good at spotting the strengths of people. And today I really owe a lot to her. My gratitude will always remain for discovering the Shobna and me who is incapable of doing many more things than what I originally wanted to just settle down. Anyway, it has been a very wonderful journey, challenging, with so many ups and downs. But uh, when we deal with the philosophy, we realize that when we withhold the principles and the philosophy, come what may, we will finally we'll find the right path. And the, uh, uh, you know, right way of doing things. And it's just this uh, April that I chose to <coughs> kind of retire from being a 
a full time directorship because I felt I've been working for many many years, being a director, doing the course and running the course and all that under uh, the auspices of IMC and IMTC Chennai. And of course, the other person who I must also always acknowledge and show my gratitude is to Mrs. Uma Shankar, who has been my guide and mentor to see my strength in becoming a director to work with adults. So these are two beautiful people in my life. Of course, the other person I will always also will fondly remember and uh, again continue to show my gratitude is Kamini Sundaram who started Abacus and hadn't she not started Abacus I would have stepped into a monster environment in Chennai. <laughs> so, yes, so it is always that uh, I feel and interestingly like whatever monster herself experienced about her work with children which all happened so providentially for me also, these were all providential experiences. Nothing was ever pre-planned. I never planned to do anything. Things just happened and I went with the flu. And I, for all that, I'm actually very grateful to Lord Sri Krishna and Radha. So yes, now today's topic, uh, three levels of obedience. Uh, quite a challenging topic and the time given to me is only an hour and a half. <laughs> I really don't know. Feel, feel free to extend the time, ma'am. It's fine. It's yours. Nothing more than uh, or more interesting than listening to you. And as you said, uh, we are all gratitude and we are all blessed to be with under Amukta, ma'am. So to bring people like all of you to us and uh, give the rich richness of uh, uh, people all over and bring them to us. Feel That's free nice. to extend. No worries. Don't think about time. Yes, I will. And go ahead. Mukta's strength is that she is highly inclusive. She believes in me. And uh, so, because I see for her, it is finally the philosophy and the spirit more than you know, adhering purely just to a certificate or subsession. And that's where I find how in her own path, in her own work, in this field, with that knowledge, how she could reach the government, reach the village, reach the uh, deprived children. And all those things that she could do is something that we, I looked at it in a sense of awe. Oh, we're a very daring lady, <laughs> extremely. That way you are all very lucky to be under her training. Yeah, but as I was saying, this uh, topic uh, about the three levels of obedience, actually, if I have to just say what are those three levels, it's a very simplest thing, three levels, and I can finish it off. But we have to find out the root cause of how this term evolved. So therefore, I've heard in this group, there are uh, some students who are at the end of the course, some are at the beginning, some are alumni, and some may have not had any, uh, but are uh, uh, those who have not done the course, but still want to understand the spirit of Monsey. So there's, it's quite a, a mixture of uh, audience that I have. So let us first look at the child from the beginning and uh, whether it's pre-primary or primary or the elementary course what we are always looking at is the child and uh, believe in the uh, philosophy that Dr. Montserrat talked about that is follow the child but when he mean by this term follow the child it's not merely just walking behind it <laughs> To be able to follow the child, you have to really understand the needs of the child. And based on the needs that is manifesting, we will be able to create the environment. And that's what Dr. Monsari did. In her own work with the children, in fact, in her first set of children, as you may all know, there were 
all slum children who had no clue about what it is to go to a school, you know, all dirty, all you know, running nose and the, the kind of, uh, they were considered a bundle of uh, most disorderly children and most, uh, you know, they were vandalizing the place. Look at but it was these children who showed her the path. So not uh, the so-called, uh, you know, coming from elite and, you know, good children and nothing, nothing. But how could she spot out? How could she see the inner urges of these children? Because of her scientific temperament, because of her ability to look at things beyond what is just seen because of her unprejudiced outlook towards the child and his development. Just as she took 20 years of hard work and experimentation to finally declare to the world about the child, it was nothing. She was constantly under challenges, thrown out of her own country also because she was declaring or talking about the true nature of the child. And that's where she stands out special. She calls it the hidden nature of the child, the true nature. So what do we mean by this true nature? What the child is actually capable of? And be, being what she is, she was the... the Doctor, she also had the knowledge of the physiological component of the child. She knew about that. And when she had the opportunity to work with children between the two and a half to six, that was the first sort of age group that she had to encounter, which also happened very providential. Because she had no plans to do anything with schooling. She was only curious to know how does a normal child learn. And if you also go back to a little bit of her first stage of experience when she, her first set of uh, children she had to work with was children with special needs. But because she saw that and she felt it was education that would help those children and in the way she could create many uh, materials and methods by which she could actually help them pass the normal exam meant for normal children, the regular exam. And that's when she started wondering if these children could be helped to this level, then what is happening to the standards of education for a normal child when he is actually sub capable of much more? That was her concern. And uh, therefore, when she had this opportunity to observe and work for these children, in fact, she doesn't hesitate even to use the term serve these children in their development. She saw through her observation how these children fought for their freedom, for movement, for making choices. I'm sure in one of your topics, their first uh, discoveries that Dr. Montserri made regarding the true nature of the child has been done. Hasn't that been done, Nalini? So if that was the case, she saw that they were capable of choosing, they were capable of concentrating, they were capable of uh, moving, uh, working towards their own development. I mean, amazing discoveries that she could make and as they were revealing their true nature, she enhanced the environment. Better the environment, more revelations happen. More revelations happen, she enhanced the environment. That's how it kept happening. And at that point is when, she, because as we know, she was a doctor, she said, if the child at two and a half is capable of all this, what is happening to the child? before he comes to this environment. 
So what kind of development is already come prepared with? That's why I'm sure you would have all heard the term when we say a developmental activity, it takes into consideration the past achievements, the present needs and how it has to help in the future. And every activity, every uh, material that is offered in this environment has to provide or uh, be able to address this development need of the child. So that's where in her research, in her work, she talked about the non-conscious powers. What do we mean by those non-conscious powers? I'm sure you may have come across the term or may, may, may in the absorbent mind. And here, majorly, she, in her book, in the absorbent mind book, she talks a lot about the home power, which in the beginning is there in the child. It works through the child, but it does not belong to the child. And it is this home power, which is like a driving force, which drives the child the first three years to make tremendous human progress with no room for fatigue, no room for tiredness. And that's why you see when young children are learning to walk, even if they fall down 50 times, they get up and walk. When they are trying to, uh, you keep saying, don't touch, they'll go and touch. Why do you think? There is always this struggle for between the adult and the child when you feel he should not be touching and he wants to touch because it is this driving force which is telling him, hey, unless you touch and feel and experience, you are not going to learn, you are not going to grow. So that is a driving force which she has coined the term for me. And this is a very, very strong driving force which is what later, when it becomes a conscious power, becomes a will power. Okay? But when it is in the state of home, the child is driven by nature's laws. So again, we need to understand whatever the child is doing during that first period when the non-conscious powers are working in the optimum, Nothing is happening by chance. He is being dictated by the laws that govern his development. Just pure nature's law. When it comes to the work of nature, it is always towards the development of the being. Is always nature always endows does things in favor of development. He doesn't do anything against his devil. And that is why that is force is there, that willpower. You want to, you may have experience of how when a child wants to climb the steps, how untiringly he'll try. Or even when he wants to hold something or lift and carry something. By one and a half, two years, you'll see all this, how children, it's, where is that energy that we, we, we are unable to deal with that energy. But that is that energy with which all children all over the world, we talk about when we are talking about all children, including a normal children, the so-called normal children, are having this home power, which is the uh, willpower, which later becomes a conscious power. So therefore, what we have to first understand is when a being has to work towards his development, he obviously has to have a strong will in order to accomplish any achievement or any task. Okay? Now, so I'm sure you've got a, just a little bit idea of this uh, Willpower, we'll keep that aside. Now, the other term that we usually use in a so called school situation is the term called discipline and a term called 
independence or responsibility and of course all these terms are very clearly uh, used in a monastery environment not just used they are given the scope for the child to manifest to really work towards his self discipline to really work towards to want to become independent and give him opportunities to become responsible however if you look at normal school situations regular schools we feel that there is always this contradiction because they feel if children are given the freedom they will not be responsible and therefore they will show indiscipline so that's what happens okay so they don't when montessori saw that freedom and discipline were two sides of the same coin what generally is seen in other uh, schools of thoughts basically or normal schooling it is that they feel if children are given freedom they will become indiscipline and therefore it is always the child who has to submit his will against the will of the teacher in order to obey the dictates of the teacher did you get it in normal situations okay leave alone school let's look at our uh, systems on the road okay traffic yes. now we all have the freedom to walk or drive ride a vehicle at least in india yes we can but and we all those who have a car will drive a car those who have a scooter will ride a scooter those who want to cycle will cycle there's somebody who is also walking you all have that but what are we also expected to follow we are supposed to follow or obey the traffic rules right there are traffic rules to be obeyed but the reality is is it really happen we can really count on our fingers if that was not the case why are there so many policemen why do we need somebody to check on us if we are following or obeying the laws there are traffic lights if you know how, what are the rules you should be able to follow and now what is happening more and more in cities earlier there was a yellow line which we had to follow so that we don't cross now what we have to see is we have to we have to uh the police or we may say the government who are government it's us only now we have in the middle of the road mini walls have been created because the public at large have stopped following the rules is it so what is happened the freedom that we are given we are not using it to obey the laws and therefore we have pushed ourselves to have an external discipline in the name of law and a police and uh, the policeman doesn't see you you feel like Well, many of us may not want to follow the and whether we in the name of education have gone to a school or otherwise these are very common sense things that we are expected to be able to follow the rules which has been made for our own good now let's look at a montessori environment in a montessori environment 
there is this will that the child has worked towards initially in a state of it was non-conscious which has been the driving force which is very essential in order to make several human achievements and during that period when the non-conscious powers are working we also have to realize that nature in its wisdom did not give the choice to the child. Why did it not give the choice? Imagine a child from birth had the choice to choose a language or speak or choose to walk or not walk. Then he may not even choose to walk or he may not even choose to speak. But nature in its wisdom did not give that choice. To become like a human being, he was asked or pushed by the home power, exercise that non-conscious will power to make several human achievements. Around this, she says, this happens between birth and two and a half, three years. It's around three years that the conscious will power starts to come into play is when the child starts learning to make choices. When we talk about choices, why should we have home? Uh, H O R N E. Shall I put it in the chat? Mm. Yeah, yeah, Nalini has already. Thank you, Nalini. So, Uh, around two and a half, slowly the willpower starts to function. And again, we have to understand it is a process. It cannot happen overnight. It takes a while. A willpower where he begins to take an activity which is within his understanding, capacity or, or intelligence and accomplishes the task with the use of his hands and moments and senses. And that's why in the pre-primary, we talk about one area that is very, very special in Montessori, which is called the exercise of practical life. Okay. And in exercise of practical life, the child is offered very, very simple activities around two and a half, like even as simple as how to put a glass down, how to carry a glass, how to roll a mat, how to unroll a mat, and slowly the challenge and the complexity gets increased and increased to the extent of how to even cook or how to weave or how to stitch and so on and so forth. That took from two and a half to six, the challenge is increased. And that's what during the course you will understand when you do the course. The, the reason why we start with simple activities, which is already with which the child is already aware, and move on to more complex activities. So again, when this willpower is in the process of development, what is he doing? He is now exercising his willpower to make choices. To make choices based on his needs. That's what we have to understand. Because he is still working towards his own self-development. So when he's making those choices, he is also able to see his ability to start an activity and complete. See, because willpower is not just about choices. To be able to accomplish a task. When you make a choice, do you hold on to the decision of the choice you have made and complete the task? And that is what often is the challenge with many, many adults also, I can say, who are very intelligent, but they are very poor with their willpower. In fact, I always say those who undergo this Montessori training program, 
I really say it's hats off to the willpower of each of the individual because this is not a course where you just finish it in one month or half a month or, you know, bits and pieces. This is a whole program. And with all your challenges that you have in your day-to-day -day life, it is your willpower your, so that helps you accomplish doing this course. So it's not just wanting to do but when you want to do, then you must also enable yourself, empower yourself to complete. And that is what a child at two and a half begins with, with simple activities. And there, at that point, when he is working on exercising his willpower to carry out activities which is helping him in his development, what is he doing? He is obeying the laws that is governing his development. That which means he cannot help but do certain things, do it again and again, again and again to work towards perfection. That is when for many of us, we may find some of the activities which very young children do, even as simple as opening and closing a door. How many of you have experienced young children? Mandapu opens, close, opens, close. For us, it looks like a useless activity. And more or less, most mothers may even get worried if you want to put his finger here and break his finger or Ha, 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 so many things we may do. Or finally, we'll give him one back and say, oh. and Then the child cries and he's ready to say, oh, he's stubborn. He's not listening. Why? Because we are interfering with our man-made laws, which is most inconsistent. Against the nature's law, which is asking him to do these exercises, do these moments so that he can work towards his development. If you ask what is the meaning of opening and closing, it's a, a great lot of meaning for the child, that whole movement of opening and closing it and closing it correctly. It's not just opening and closing. I mean, haven't experienced, even if they have put the latch, he wants to put it exactly into the hole. It all calls for concentration. No? Even as simple as pouring. Initially, because uh, moments are not still co coordinated, it may, some water may drop, some grains may spill. But he wants to repeat, repeat, repeat. Because of the human tendency to work towards perfection. Because he's a human child, he's like us. And when we all believe that we want to work towards perfection, we want to do a good job in whatever we want to do, we have to also realize that's how a child is. At his capacity, whatever he wants to do, he wants to do it well. And if he has to do it well, he has to have the freedom to repeat till he feels he's done it well. Isn't it? Isn't that very important? When you all, many of you, those who know cycling and driving or some new skills that you learned. How many attempts did you have to do? Let's take cycling. How many of you know cycling here? No. Did you all, when you sat on the cycle, you could ride cycling very easily? No, ma'am. Uh, did you have to, how, how many times do you think you fell down? Many yes. times. So it's many times <laughs> fell down. But then, did you give up? No. Why didn't you want to give up? You're you falling down. <laughs> you hurt. wanted to be perfect, ma'am. Yeah, you wanted to. It's just so important. It's so this falling down and getting hurt, the least bit of a concern. Doesn't matter. I can't. Yes. You know, also, what made you feel you could achieve because you saw people riding a cycle. They were the role models on the road we were riding a circle, maybe your father or brother or 
and that was a perfection that you also wanted to achieve and you realize it needs practice it needs repetition and then the day you learn finally got the balance and you could imagine i'm sure many of you have started who learned cycling like, like years back there are two challenges right one was to first balance your your feet on the pedal to ensure you don't fall the other challenge was to look in the front if you were watching here you would go and dash somewhere if you were not looking in the front you had to. similarly is the case those are uh, those who drive because you cannot be watching your uh, keep your feet on the accelerator and the clutch and uh, uh, that brake your eyes have to be here the legs have to do its job what a challenge yeah similarly is the challenge for the child even as simple as pouring water he had to hold it firmly take the other glass and as he's pouring he has to see with his eyes that it is poured without spilling outside and then poured up till that particular mark if it is being presented to him in a monastery environment where we say you pour only up till this mark and there still he may want to be very careful because he knows when you pour something from a larger container into a smaller quantity why do we pour we do we pour not to spill things out we pour because we want to keep them safe in another is it and that's what he has seen at home once mothers pouring when you buy the groceries from the packets into the uh, jars from when she's serving tea or coffee from a larger vessel into smaller glasses so many things that he has observed and that's what he wants to do and all that he has to work on his will power to accomplish the task and not just do the task anyhow anyway but to work towards perfection and towards that when he has to work towards that perfection he has to obey the laws of nature which demands that he concentrates on the work in hand only when that concentration happens does he can be capable of doing it independently and then through his work through his practice does it so easily that it becomes a part of his life blood and flesh which i'm sure now when we talk about uh, another area i suppose that a quite an interesting area for all of us especially as women about cooking i enjoy cooking <laughs> so all of us when we first cook surely all of us had had some accidents would have burnt the potatoes or forgot to even switch on the gas so many things but because of the love for cooking because we see cooking as as not a mere cooking not as a chore when you look at it as a skill and ultimately an art then we work on doing it the best yeah any any even those who are doing fashion designing or jewelry or gardening or ikabama any human uh, skill and finally an art is a work of such tremendous work and hard work done by the adult which calls for a lot of concentration and that's what a child is also capable of working towards when from a very young age and therefore what dr motsari very strongly says is when he is exercising his will power and is trying to carry out an activity with absolute concentration we have to respect that when he is uh, obeying the laws that is governing his development we have to respect that and not poke our nose through our man made laws 
and destroy that power of concentration. Destroy that willpower. Because she also says the arrogant adult or the so-called uh, adult who have it's sad that we, uh, we when we don't understand we want somebody to obey our dictates by ensuring that they, the other person suppresses his welfare. So he cannot think for himself. And that's what we hear of uh, many teachers in the school. No talking. You'll only say what auntie tells you or teacher tells you. You don't ask for more. You quietly listen. How can we learn like that? No, whereas in the monastery environment, we encourage children asking questions. We encourage children expressing their thoughts. Because only when they express their thoughts, their feelings, their wishes, do we know what level of understanding is happening. Yeah? So, in the first step, we have to see that the Willpower with which the child is working is to obey the laws that govern his development. And when he is obeying the laws of his development, there may be many occasions when the child may respond to your request and there may be Many such equations when he will not respond to your request. When will he respond to your request and obey you? When what you say and what he needs match. Otherwise, he will follow his own dictates, which he cannot help following because of laws of nature. And if that is not understood by us, we readily label children by saying he's stubborn, he does not listen. How many times I must tell him he's disobedient and so on and so forth. Because we are not aware that the child has no intention not wanting to disobey us. But he has to first obey the laws that is governing his development. And that is why it seems as if he's not listening to you and me. Don't climb the staircase. He'll fall down. But he will. Is it because he doesn't want to listen to you? No. Because he has to learn and go through the experience what it means to climb a staircase. Don't run. You will fall down. Have you... I'm sure we have heard that millions of times with many people or any adult and a child that, no, oh, no, 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 don't run. No, 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 don't touch. No, no. But unless he runs, how will he learn what it is to run? Then, oh, you never listen to me. It's very difficult to bring you out. I will not take you out, sir. If I take you, you run away. Very difficult. Why? Because we can't deal with his energy. That's a problem. That is the main problem. Because his energies are very high. And we also don't know how to channelize that energy in a way that is going to help him in his development. That is also the problem. What we only could mostly generally will say, no, 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 don't do, don't do, or Label him saying he's stubborn, he's difficult, he's uh, restless. Of course, now the very favorite word which we hear from every mother, oh, he's so hyper. He's smilingly, we use these terms. In fact, hyper is a very clinical term. We can't loosely use it. He's hyper. Very difficult. Not listening. Why should... He always listen to you because we want to make our jobs easy. 
That is the whole idea. So that first step, what happens? I will also later read to you quickly the first, second, and third level of obedience. But you first understand in the first state, in the first two and a half, three years, when he is working on a willpower which is driving him to make several human conquests, he has to follow the laws that is governed in his development. Thereby, it appears to us that he is not listening to us. Sometimes he will listen, sometimes he does not listen. So when he listens, you are very happy. When you ask something and he happens to do it for you, you are like, you know, I'm sure as mothers and uh, when you're two, two and a half for uh, learning to walk or he's learned to sing one song for you, okay, some song which you have been humming and immediately you want him to sing for some guest. You won't. Okay, see? You, are, you know this song, no? Now this uh, uncle has come, this auntie has come, please sing. And you'll be saying, no, he actually sang so well. But I don't know why he's not singing. Then one more step. See, if you sing, I'll give you one. I'll give you sweet. I'll give you gulab. If you don't sing, mommy will not love you. That is it. These are the threats that we use very easily, loosely, thinking that he has to always obey you. But he has no intention not to obey you because he's also being dictated by his own laws that is governing his development. And that is what we have to become very aware of. In fact, I'm sure many of you would have also experienced this when I mean, the mothers prepare, you know, and they have to go I mean, in the cities and all. I don't know if things have changed. Interview, na? In school. Nursery school interview. The child has to learn the names of some colors and numbers and A, B, C, D and who will say it in front of the principal. So the mother will prompt. Ah, uh, tell the names of numbers? No. Or you show it some color, you show green and he will say pink. And the mother is very embarrassed or the parent. Oh, actually he knows all the names, but I don't know why he's not telling us. Because why should he say everything because somebody wants? And who's that somebody? According to you, she's the principal of a big school, but as a child, no, who is he? He has not built up any relationship with that person. And why am I being asked to obey something in front of a total stranger? I'm sure none of us would like to be dictated like that. Yeah? When you are introduced to somebody, there is a way in which you are introduced to some example and say if a husband wants you to know his friend, the way he introduces you to him or him to you, there's a polite way, there's a you know, way in which you expect him to also he can't just say, hey, that's my friend, just say hello. Would you, you, you say hello to him? You won't. So, so much etiquette and so much of uh, value we uh, give when it comes to adult relationship. What about the child? We take all that for granted. Anyway, so. Now we will look at a child who is working in a Montessori environment. Where, because we are also working or talking about the philosophy of Montessori, we are looking at an environment where it has been made very conducive for the child's development. And the adults who are working with the children there who are trained, who have the knowledge of how to offer the right help, the right time, the right manner, is when, when you have also built up a beautiful relationship with the child, 
that the child trusts you for everything that you're going to offer. Because she sees in you a person, a being, who is doing things for his development. She's giving me something for me to learn. She's giving me a ribbon frame for me to tie a ribbon. She's showing me how to count. So wonderful, no? She's helping me learn so many things. So here, the child now wants to listen to you where his willpower matches the invitation of all your presentations. And that's why we say in a presentation, we have first invite. Isn't it? That's very important. You don't drag a child and say, hey, now I'm going to show you color tablets. You better learn. No. Invite. We say, I, shall I show you colors today? You would like to work with this material? Very polite. And by the way we have invited, it ignites the curiosity of the child. And there is also willing to accept an invitation about an activity which is totally strange. That's why we, if you remember, we say we first offer exercise of practical life because these are all activities which are something the child has seen from birth but may have not had enough opportunities to do them at home. Whereas, when it comes to the sensorial activities or math activities or certain concrete language materials, these are all strange. He's never seen them. But because this adult has been giving me things which I like, I'm sure whatever she is going to give me is something that I will like. So that is a trust that child develops in the adult. Therefore, when you invite, he's ready to accept your invitation. And then, of course, the presentation happens. And so this is the second level of obedience. And Dr. Montsori says that trust that the child develops in this adult comes to such a superior level that whatever the adult wants to say or express almost becomes like a command for the child to readily obey unquestioningly. In fact, Dr. Monsery says it's a matter of great danger for the adult because the adult has to be very, very carefully say what she needs to say because the child is now going to obey you without question. So imagine the level of responsibilities that we have when the children arrive at this. It's like those ancient uh, gurukulam where the guru says something, the disciples accept without question. That humility, the humbleness that they develop in themselves to feel that whatever my guru says is the truth and that's a fact. There is no need for me to question. Because whatever he is going to do is for my good. So therefore, in this third level of obedience, it is almost like a relationship with God and a devotee. You know? So that's the highest level. Because God can do no wrong. So also the child thinks that this auntie here can do no wrong. She's such perfect person because she's always been giving things to me, helping me do so much for my own devil. Help me to help myself. So I'll quickly, briefly read this uh, three levels of obedience from the book called Absorb in mind. So she says, 
what we call the first level of obedience is that in which the child can obey but not always. It is a period in which obedience and disobedience seem to be combined. Again, this disobedience is not to be considered as wanting to be disobedient to the dictates of the adult. Purely, we have to understand, he has to obey the laws that is governing his development more than what he can obey the man-made laws. This is still in the process of development. So that is a first level of obedience. Where sometimes he may be seemingly to listen to us, obey us. As I said, when it matches his needs and when it does not match, it seems as if he does not want to obey. Okay? Whereas in the second level, she says the second level is when the child can always obey. Or rather, when there are no longer any obstacles deriving from his lack of control. His powers are now consolidated and can be directed not only by his own will, but also by the will of another. That is, I am willing to withhold my will in favor of you because I have that power to control my own desire for the time being. This is a great step forward in the path to obedience. It is like being able to translate from this language to that. The child can absorb another person's wishes and express them in his own behavior. And this is the highest form of obedience to which present-day education even aspires. The ordinary teacher asks only that she be obeyed. Here it is not like that. See, when we say the child can absorb another person's wishes and expresses them in his own behavior, for example, if the child is asking, or if the adult is asking when you're working, for example, you're, the child is doing some work, if she politely asks, can you help me keep this uh, chair from here to there, child will immediately do it, even though he may be doing something else. Yeah? So... In favor of the other person's request. And he sees that for the time being, I am doing something, but I can keep that aside and ask or listen to the other person and obey their request. And then she says, but the child, when allowed to develop in accordance with the laws of his nature, goes much further than this, further than we should ever have expected. He goes to the level of, the third level of obedience. So she says, here is someone so far above me that she can exert an influence on my mind and makes me as clever as she is. She acts inside me. That's, that's what she, Dr. Monsery says a child feels about the adult there. So, because she, the child is capable of seeing the capacity of the adult, the powers, the one who's helping me learn so many things, helping me learn so many concepts, helping me know <coughs> so many uh, things in arithmetic, in language, in science, in botany, zoology. So obviously she must be a person with such capacity. And so I can and I will let her influence my mind and make me as clever as she is. 
to feel like this seems to fill the child with joy and he is doing it with joy he wants to aspire to be like his auntie like the teacher who's telling you so many lovely stories so many interesting activities that she shared obviously she must be a very powerful person is what the child may be thinking In fact, she says another plane. It resembles perhaps the instinct of the dog who loves his master and gives effect to his will by obedience. He gazes intently at the ball his master shows him, and when this is thrown to a distance, runs for it and brings it back triumphantly. Then he waits for the next order. He longs to be given orders and runs joyfully to obey them, wagging his tail. the child's third level of obedience is not unlike this certain it is that he obeys with astonishing readiness and seems anxious to do so in fact they ask us what do you want me to do auntie tell me tell me they may even go to that and and it is done with happiness with joy huh? in that in the absorb in mind i'm sure all of you most of you will have the copy she talks about a fact an experience which one teacher shared direct us shared she had a class where she conducted extremely well but often she could not restrain herself from giving suggestions one day she said put everything away before you go home tonight the child did not wait for her to finish her sentence but directly they heard her say put everything away that's what they heard so before she completed her sentence they started putting things away they started to do it with great care and speed then with surprise they heard the words when you go home tonight their obedience has become so prompt that the teacher had to be very careful how she expressed herself in fact she out to, out on this occasion to have said before you go home tonight Put everything away. So actually, you have to be very careful what you say, because almost your words, your expressions become like a matter of law. They want to carry it out, whatever you say. Like and and this is and, also and, this is and, also and this is also. because of that unconditional love that the child has towards the adults especially in the first 6 years the love that the child has for the adult is unconditional and that's where our role as adults as educators as parents in fact is lot more challenging because we have to match to his unconditional love and not just use love as a bait or a, a carrot or a tool to make him do things or not make him do things because when he loves he loves without conditions and that's what we always want to learn from the child but as he grows he realizes the adult society is such that uh, the love is always conditional And then he also says, "If I have to survive, I have to be talking like the adults, which actually the innocent child never wanted to do that. But we have been very good in making them obey and train them, thanks to what Montessori never hesitates to say, a very strong statement: the sins of omission and commission by the adults because of our ignorance." what does that mean what adults end up doing what we should not do or we do not do what we should do and we are the cause for his deviations the child who otherwise is so loving who is so caring who was come into this world to want to learn with joy with enthusiasm 
with happiness, we destroy all that. And then we think we have to now set rules to make him become obedient. Only then he will become a good boy or a good girl. Yeah? So see what what we do. And all that thing, we even destroy all the innocence and goodness by the time he's two and a half three. And that is why in the monastery environment, we have to keep offering the exercise of practical life to help the child to get back to normality, normalization. Have you come across that term? Normality. You have to help him regain his normality, which has all gone hidden, suppressed, thanks to the man-made laws that we have created against the laws of his development, against nature's And here, he also talks about the silence game, if you come across that topic, where she just writes the word silence when they all withdraw to remain silent. And when we talk about the silence game, it's not just being silent with the mouth. The entire body is still. Children love all this. And also, what we have to understand with the speciality of Montessori education is that it is so much of control of one's own senses, one's own movements in favor of them. Finally, controlling our own mind. Because if you, you or we or the child learns how to control oneself, our own mind, then the mind becomes our friend. But if the mind controls us, it can become our enemy. Isn't it? We have to be dictates. We have to tell our mind what to do, what not to do. How to lead our life. And not let the mind rule us. And we, we see enough experiences all over the world when the mind rules person and then what happens. Those who drink or those who do no, have no control over many things because they are following the dictates of them. But and they allow themselves to become slaves of them. Whereas you have to control them. And that is the beauty that is really very beautifully and practically addressed in the Montessori environment where for every aspect of his development is offered that help in the manner in which his senses, his movements are controlled to an extent to further perfect and to take him to a level of refinement. Because I'm sure those are all those are all making notes and writing down, because not putting everything in the computer now. When you write, doesn't it require controlled movements? It becomes. When you ride a cycle, do you require a controlled movement? When you drive, when you cook, when you sing. All beautiful things that we do, which is sensible, which is beautiful, thing of art, everything requires control movements. What do you mean by control movements? Dictated by the mind and the brain, the intelligence, persevered by the willpower, and the result is seen by the work of the hand. And any, any work that we do, which is human, which is intelligent, which is meaningful, which is productive, are all activities of a controlled mind and controlled moment. And that is what we nurture in a Montserian. Right from the beginning. 
That's right. He requires controlled movement to pour a water pour water from a jug to a glass. He needs controlled movements to roll a mat, unroll a mat, carry something, walk carefully. Yeah, speak softly. Do the counting in number rods by putting his fingers in each section. One, two, three. Tracing the sandpaper letters in a controlled movement in the way it has to be written. Everything, you see, that's the whole beauty. The control. So only when that is happening, so when we say that control movement is when we are able to obey those laws of it. Okay. So now, just to quickly uh, revise on the three levels, which is the experience of Dr. Montessori in a Montessori environment. That's why she was able to talk about it because of the environment she has created and whatever she has created even today, all that will be experienced by anybody who creates that kind of thing. It's not that it was there only during her time. Even all of us can experience. Provided we are able to work to the way that she worked towards the philosophy. Therefore, we understand the first stage, first level of obedience, there are moments when the child may obey and there are moments when he may not obey, which we may call disobey. But we have to say he will obey when obey our request or obey our order when his needs and our request or order matches. That's the first level. In the second level, he is willing to always obey because he realizes that the you have to do yes or no. It's other than your right. Uh, also, control something in favor of the other person's will. It could be also a request of a friend. But I'm willing to obey you against my immediate requirement because I've also developed the willpower to wait and obey your requirement, follow what you want. And then go back to work because I can, I know how to suppress my willpower for a period of time. Yeah? So that's is the second level. Absorb another person's wishes and express them in his own behavior through his own self. And that's what uh, that's what she says. All the teachers want children to follow in all over the world. Then when I'm when I'm talking, and I want everybody to listen to me to pay attention to what I'm saying. But whatever I'm saying, if it is something that is going to help in the development of the child, surely the child will also suppress his willpower for a short while and go back to doing what he wants. And then when it comes to the third level of obedience, she says, it is to such great extent or such deep trust and belief that the child has in the adult because she say, she feels that is such a wonderful person who is giving so much for me. So no matter what she says is a word of law and I'm willing to follow. So that's why she says it's quite a responsibility on the part of the adult when the child arrives at this Every word that you utter becomes like a Vedava, like Gita or uh, Quran or Bible. So we have to be a lot more careful. We can't just skip something and say, no, 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 see, Anna, I didn't really mean that. No. Everything you say, we realize you mean that. We can't joke about all those things. Okay, so that is in the third level of obedience. And 
these are things that once we create that environment and we are able to really uh, do justice to the child or the children in their development and truly work with that spirit, understanding the philosophy. We can all, I'm sure, will experience this. Because it's nothing that uh, beyond uh, us. Only thing is we need to understand what Montessori talked about. Finally, the method, what she gave, what was beautiful with Montessori is the philosophy that she spoke about, she gave it in a very practical manner for all of us to actually put it into practice. Experiencing becoming the philosophy. So we can all work towards that. And I'm sure everybody is capable of it. Just that we also, also have to work on our own willpower to say yes. I, I'm also capable. But all of these, of course, requires tremendous level of patience, perseverance on the part of the adult as much. And uh, our goal here is to really, really see Montessori's definition for education. She says education is an aid to life. We have really helped them live their life true to their nature. We don't have to worry about other things. We don't have to be worrying whether we going to get good marks, whether he's going to get a seat in MBBS or he's going to pass me to exam. We have given him that confidence. We have given him that capacity that he has gained through his own hard work, of course, with our help. Please remember when we talk about independence and all that, our role is indispensable. We cannot do without this. We have to offer the help that he requires for this. And therefore, we have to be a lot more careful and responsible. So there is so much that we can offer. And he is completely dependent on us for his development. But he is also capable of working towards his own health. A role as a facility. So always nurturing and making the environment, enhancing it better and better. We'll also should, definitely will experience what Montserrat experienced. All of us. And that's why it still exists, right? What she talked about 100 years back. I mean, today, all the facts are there and we do experience when we set up that kind of an end. Okay, so I think I've managed. It's just about 10 minutes more. <laughs> so if you have any questions, anything that you want to talk about or ask, please feel please and let me see whether I'm capable of answering all your questions. Yes, Harshi. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. I just wanted to understand one thing, like when we are in Montessori environment, mm -hmm. uh, should we force the child to obey the rules in the environment or initially we can allow them to do what they want to? No, right from the beginning, it's important that we guide. Them. But yeah. if you have to uh, match, that's why we call the value of presentations. In the initial stage when they join and they're still settling down, they are crying and they need Maybe you offer some what she calls preliminary activities and let them settle down with some work in the hand, which I'm sure okay. you have all experienced with young children. Even if they're crying, if you give them a puzzle, you may cry, I want mommy, but it will still work. But that the work of the hand starts absorbing his uh, energies into it, helping him get over the emotions that he has. Okay. And so once that settling period happens and when he is uh, 
slowly getting into understanding the rules of the environment, then it's best that we give the right presentations continuously. So that because even when we say he has to make a choice, it has to be with knowledge. Yes. It cannot be without knowledge. Because he has to be helped to what to choose. That's why the, uh, the range of choice slowly increased. Mm -hmm. We don't give 50 things. We give three to four presentations, maybe over a week, then 10, 15, then the range, and then the choice then increases. Then it is also within his capacity to make those choices. So we have to slowly build it up. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and ma'am, uh, what about uh, at home, like, with the child, should we behave the same what we behave in the school environment? Yeah, if their parents are also have this <laughs> understanding, I'm sure yes. they will create that environment. After all, when Montessori talked about it, it is not exclusive only for the environment you create. Why can't a home be a, an environment which offers that kind of uh, home also, parents also, everywhere? Then... Yeah. We, we are in a, the flow of the child, the development of the child happens more naturally. Otherwise, we are always, there is a conflict. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes, Isha. Um, good, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful session and, uh, you know, taking so much away from this session. So I have a question here, not specifically with the environment the classroom setup but let's say if the child has a will to do something but doesn't have the skills to do it but the will is there because child might have seen someone doing it and wants to do it how we can help child in that case we know that you know for, for, for example a very simple example you know to make uh, an origami uh, something but child doesn't have the skills i mean as an adult we can model it you know but then the child wants to work on it every day how we can help the child we can't just straight away say no and kill the will yeah of course not we'll yeah so you start are there the simplest steps of origami for example you're taking mm -hmm. first is mm -hmm. just folding that's a skill yeah. folding the paper then after that, what is the next? So you take them through all the steps. Mm -hmm. Child, I mean, how does this the skill is only developed by the use of the hands? Right. Yeah. So if the child is showing that interest, and why is he showing? If, for example, you, are you married? Your children? Yes, I am married. I have. So married. if you are a person, an expert in origami, and you love doing it, the child will have a natural inclination to want to do. But at two and a half, can you make him do a complex flower? No. No. So start with the base. No. And then take it. Take. And by doing that, you also will be able to gauge how is his uh, level of interest is developed. So then make it uh, more and more challenging. And uh, you, wish, you may be surprised by his own creativity or her creativity. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a basic thing. Once you, when he's showing an inclination, how do you offer the help? And if you know how to offer the help, do it in the right way. And everything that's what Montessori talks about, take it from simple to complex. Yeah? yeah. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, Namrita? Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the wonderful insight. Uh, a lot of things uh, which now I can relate to. Uh, I just had a question about normalization uh, that you had mentioned. Uh, at, at often at times when the child keeps growing, we see that we lose, uh, we see a quality losing in them, maybe a characteristic or maybe a good quality. So when you say to regain uh, back to their normal, uh, you know, uh, character yeah. or their quality, uh, how do you then do it? Do you still do it through presentations or do you have a more practical life into it? Yeah, see, in a way we say excess of practical life does help the child work towards normalization in the sense that what they are offering are activities that are within his level of understanding, his intelligence, 
of all the various activities which the child has been watching from the moment of birth. But here he is getting an opportunity to actually carry it out. So the activity is within his understanding and with his, his own willpower of complete, completing in activity. Yeah. And finally, he sees the result of, for example, pouring water. Okay. So I am by showing him the presentation of how to pour water and then letting the child do it. What is it that to make the child feel that I can do? I am capable. So when the child feels that I am capable, which means I am being helped to do things which I am good at. So what is my sense of achievement? Emotionally, how am I? I am enriched. I am at peace. And you, the adult, now trust me that I am capable. So um, that is the thing. Then, then I show love. I show joy in doing all these things. And when somebody is joyful, happy, is able to accomplish something, he is a person who is normalized because he loves to work. Uh, just adding on, ma'am, uh, if I see a child uh, being so interested in reading and suddenly he loses that interest. Um, so as an adult, uh, I would want to start reading myself so he, you know, observes me and starts reading. So see, that's these, how it when, By the time they come to the level of reading, uh, you must also figure out uh, why has he moved away from that. What are the other things that is attracting him? Or what has he seen in the environment? A mother who was reading every day. Because remember, when they whatever they learn, it is also what is alive in the environment. That is what is absorbed. So we have to figure out what is what has stopped him from reading. Or sometimes it could be a passing phase also. We have to be a little bit patient. If he's genuinely keen in reading and you know, doing such things, they always come back. Maybe the books he's reading, the, uh, the levels he's outgrown that. Maybe he needs more. I don't know. That we have seen. Okay. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Well, yes, Usha. Hello, ma'am. Actually, the question is for, I think, for the elementary children. Since I work in elementary school, I mean, because of the COVID situation, there are children who have not gone to school at all, the pre-primary. And uh, because of that, there is no order in the child. Like it is like how to get it because we don't have much of the EPL activities in elementary. Very few. See, when we talk about elementary child, what we have to also understand is, uh, yeah, COVID has did whatever good or bad it has done. We still have to move on in life. But uh, for the elementary children. What, how, it's not through exercise of practical life per se that you bring in order. It, in, even, even in a science experiment or something, for example, is there an order? What do you mean by order there? There is a sequence to be followed. Yeah? So, how do you nurture that? And then slowly take them able to follow them. some things which uh, during that sensitive period when they had to do they had not much opportunity. It may appear to be lost, but what is most important is as an adult, as a parent, as an educator, please don't give up. You have to persevere. Maybe your own struggles have to be double, triple. But the love that you give, genuine love and care and help them arrive at it, will get the result. Nothing, it's no magic. There is enough hard work on our part. It cannot always be that the issue is with the child. I always say there are no problem children, it's a problem adults. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Krishna Veni. Good afternoon, ma'am. 
the thing is like we have spoke you have given a beautiful insight on normalization with regard to child how would normalization with regard to an adult who is who got influenced by traditional schooling now is into training into monastery so it has you know now, you you should know what it means to be normalized by <laughs> yes you i mean we got through some education doesn't matter at least now we are conscious yeah. now we are aware so can we now work on our will power to work towards that it's within our control but yes yes lot more will power yes yes that's true yeah, okay. yeah. shamani yeah. shamani hello ma'am yes thank you ma'am thank you for the for all the inputs and you have given the framework which can be applicable for anybody to build a beautiful relation not only for a children i can see the framework which we can apply to anybody in a family outside anybody with any stranger this is so beautiful and my question is not question actually uh, you were in the in, uh, starting of the uh, topic you were about to talk about something regarding the uh, uh, special kids or the challenged kids and uh, uh, did you miss on it to talk about it? no no i said dr monsery's own work began with her special work kids. with special children because she had to do as a person was doing this her intern in his medical college so it providentially happened but because of her being a genius and whatever she the great person that she was she was able to see that it is education that helps a child learn and develop not medication because in those days if somebody was retarded they only thought they could be given medicine to calm down even today that is happened because you don't know how to deal with them so you suppress them through medication and that is what she was experienced in the so called uh, Uh, hospital where she was going but she was always a very brave courageous woman who always looked to helping child humanity from a different perspective child is Therefore, a child mm -hmm. her contemporaries were you must have heard of dr sigan and idart who were also people who were working with children with uh, difficulties physical and her framework is something she worked and help these children come to the normal uh, right the normal school uh, common board exam that's where she realized if these children could be uh, raised to that level and in the normal children are writing that exam which means they, what is happening to the education of a normal child and so she wanted to uh, see how to help children children at large because they are going to be the future citizens that's how there was a big point in her life so the framework is same for anybody because a child is a child yeah. whoever yes. okay yeah. and one more thing uh, a question is popping up uh, montessori method is something uh, we see it as like a, a child is self motivated uh, but uh, uh, i don't want to label any child uh, like uh, uh, kids with the challenges or struggles Uh, they lack self motivation because they are so much inclined to one kind of thing or uh, uh, so how do we uh, self uh, bring self motivation in them or because according to uh, principles of montessori we we don't motivate the kids they get self motivated but uh, see if you have done everything at the right time right from the beginning it is a very natural thing in a child to be self motivated If he has ended up not having self motivation, we have to reflect on ourselves. As I said, could have been a problem that we have created because of which he's lost that. We have to somehow do whatever we need to do to regain that. He's born to want to learn, right? Showing inclination to learn, to touch, to to, to do so many things which is there in him. And down the line, we have destroyed it because we are we don't know how to deal with that. Thank so you. a lot of self reflection is required there is no ready made answer that i can give okay. next study it. the child observe yes thank you yes sangeeta namaste ma'am yes i am from 
I'm a pre-primary teacher. Uh, I for Yukin School. So since I had a uh, had school, I just came. I logged in at the last moment. And uh, the thing is, uh, even in our class, like I uh, I know about Montessori. We are working with uh, dual uh, thing. Uh, I mean, we have two teachers. One she takes care of the environment. One I take care of the class. And uh, the the class, if it comes to like thirty, thirty one, thirty four children in the at the same time, uh, but it's quite challenging um, for me to discipline the class and uh, uh, the children behavior uh, and all those to get into their attention. That is one thing is uh, bothering me. So, is there any way to uh, handle uh, those? Uh, as you say, we can't use the word hyper. Uh, they are very restless and uh, the attention individually they are talented uh, if we give one on one they are okay but if it is in the group when i give the instruction or to have any group activity then uh, they become go out of order and uh, they mess up the entire thing sangeeta my so, simplest uh, uh, <laughs> practical suggestion i may say if you are good at singing just sing for them when you sing for them <laughs> they will pay attention and then okay. the songs then you see singing and music as its own soothing mm -hmm. don't start with instructions okay. so let's just sing let's sing sing as the singing happens and i say okay now now i want to say something to you to the own all pay attention and i'm sure they will do that give prizes and let me know. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so I'll definitely follow this tip. Yeah, thank Please. you so much. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Have a nice day. Yeah, Isha also still has her hands up. Yes, Isha. Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, um, we know that the child in the initial years till two and a half, three is absorbed in mind. So, uh, consciously, unconscious, like. Uh, we consciously, we have to take care of each and every moment which we make. uh because child is absorbing it uh then we go to the primary from 3 to 6 when we are doing certain things we are very precise about our uh, you know uh, uh what we are doing so basically what we are modeling the child is absorbing everything why that uh, decreases as the child uh, grows like you know we so don't be that much a human being in her life <laughs> so many people around him It is absorbing and modeling, and but if he has been brought up by you, and if you seen you as a person actually being conscious and careful in many things, whatever may be the external influences, if there is beauty and sincerity in what you do, they will come back to you. You have to explore the world around it, but you, what we do, we, we believe in the truth, and we will always. Because truth will always triumph. You don't uh, get flabbergasted by influences outside. That is always going to be. That's a challenge. Yeah. I have one more question. So, uh, how does a child perceive, like you know, take it when there is a difference of opinion between among two adults? So, what impact does it make on the child? You know what, whatever. But if you are honest enough to talk about it to the child, you can't explain too many things to very young children. The older ones, but wherever honesty works, but you have to also leave it to the child because every human child also has the capacity to deal with life. You cannot deal for him everything in life. Finally, you have to let go of your own child. You have to trust that capacity. Okay. Yes, thank you. Oh uh, yeah, ma'am. As you said uh, that we we have to respect the child's concentration. Like whenever the child is doing something, we should not destroy his concentration and all. But I wanted to understand one thing that when the child is the has finished the work and uh, the child has come to us to show whatever he's done. So that time he won't appreciate his work. He will naturally go down. We, so we should we appreciate him or make him understand that 
you have to work like this you give a good smile appreciate that is enough you don't have to put stars and make hookah out of it just smile when i make a nice cake what do i do i give it to you eat oh yeah that was nice. that's all because i myself know what i've done is well i only want to yeah. taste yeah you don't say oh, okay for this cake i'm going to take you for a movie and all let's not land up into this situation make it simple straightforward and children are capable of taking all of it see there's there's no need in appreciation encouragement and Landing up is the material reward because when you land up there, we never know where to draw the line. Okay, we never. We don't so we say, need not framework them. We need not uh, show them you have to do like this or do like that. No, I mean, if, we need not uh, correct no. them. Sahi Harshita, if it requires correction, do it in the way that is productive. I'm not saying you have to blindly accept. Okay. You can say, can we maybe can we draw this line like this? Can we do this better, or you give a second presentation? Maybe he's missed out those points. So that's where yes. you have to see. What are you? Are you jumping into corrections, or saying okay? First, say what is positive, nice, correct things, and then say maybe these things have to work. They are very receptive about your uh, comments, and especially young ones don't make any fuss. Even older ones, yeah. if they have lived, learned to accept all this. The way it has to be. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Thank Tina. you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes. Tina, you have to unmute Tina. Yes. So sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, I have a question regarding M two and M threes. Uh, I have seen those children still wants uh, EPL activities more, like chana pounding. Or uh, making chapati, but uh, uh, being their day with uh, many arithmetic and language activities, sometimes it becomes difficult to give them those activities. So, what strategy works better? Strategy maybe to say, okay, now that you have been introduced to these math and language activities, I would like to want you to work on these, and then once you're finished, to take. The activities of those uh, like uh, channa pounding, I'm sure that will help you relax. But don't ever say big work, small work. And uh, yeah, yeah, they have to, you have to guide them. But uh, as I said, uh, we shouldn't have even landed up in this situation. But the thing is, yeah, yeah like the uh, new joinees uh, like directly they have joined in M two M three. Then we have shown uh, APL activities, but we can't uh, give them more of those. So, so you can only, like they have not experienced. That. These are important. These are things that this is the time that you learn this also. But you can always go back to it and uh, show them more uh, challenging activities. Not just the older children show them washing clothes, ironing clothes. Mm -hmm. Those kind of more challenging, or even making a sandwich. Well, in exercise of practical life, apparently they want to do something with their hands. See, math work is a work of the intelligence that they have to focus. So, it's, you know, exercise of practical life also gives scope for relaxing. You know? it's, a, it's therapeutic. So, give those activities which that older child can take it as a challenge and work. Then he will not, because there is nothing else and they only want to go and come. You have to think on those things. Okay. So I think it's time also. Can I have Nalini around? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for coming in and sharing uh, your wisdom to all of us. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll wish we'll hear you more in coming ah, days. Too. <laughs> me too. It's very lovely being amongst all of you. So I hope you have some idea. And uh, I always say when I talk as a so-called experienced person, I always take a lot of all your lovely experiences because there's constant learning from each of us. You have your wonderful experiences, which is also that I continue to learn from everybody else. Thank you so much.